So good evening, everybody. Um, I'm very, very uh, pleased to introduce Catherine Hart, who's an assistant professor in the University of Cincinnati Department of Otolaryngology and Head and Neck Surgery. She gave an absolutely fantastic talk in December of last year on pediatric airway stenosis, which you may have been um, part, um, been able to attend. And if you haven't, please do go and um, see that talk. It's really, really fantastic. Tonight, she is giving a talk um, on pediatric aspiration evaluation and management. And we're so grateful for her time and expertise on this very interesting and challenging topic. So I'll hand over to her um, and she will go through her talk. Thank you very much. Thanks for the introduction and thanks for the invitation uh, to come and present again. Um, it's afternoon here in Cincinnati, so good evening there. Good afternoon here. Um, so um, so uh, today I'm going to talk about pediatric aspiration. Uh, you can see the outline here. We'll just briefly go over what the definition of aspiration is, how we diagnose it, and then talk a little bit about the medical and surgical management. It can be a pretty nuanced topic, so trying to, trying to cram in at least all the basics and, and uh, certainly uh, welcome questions um, as we go along or at the end. Um, so just to start off on kind of the, it seems like this part should be pretty straightforward. You know, what exactly is aspiration? And the most basic definition is that aspiration is solid or liquid matter passing below the vocal cord level. Seems like it should be pretty straightforward. There are, are however, people who believe that it's really only truly aspiration if you have things passing below the vocal cords and that's causing some sort of pulmonary compromise. So it gets a little bit nitpicky, um, but ultimately, you know, what, what you're trying to prevent is the pulmonary compromise. Um, so um, you want, you, we just, you don't want stuff other than air down in the airway is what it comes down to. When we think about children who are most at risk of aspirating, you can kind of break them down into a few different groups. Um, and that's important as, as you see as we go a little further along because you manage them pretty differently depending on what the etiology is. So the, the big groups are those who have an anatomic problem. So they've got a tracheoesophageal fistula, a laryngeal cleft, an esophageal stricture, some sort of anatomic issue that is predisposing them to aspirating or causing the aspiration. Then there's the group of kids who have a neurologic disorder, um, particularly central neur neurologic disorders, um, so cerebral palsy, anoxic brain injury, any other central cause that, that causes hypotonia, those are kids who are prone to aspirate. And then there are some peripheral neurologic disorders that can also uh, lead to, uh, or predispose to aspiration. So congenital infections, dysmotility of the esophagus, um, ch children with CHARGE syndrome have really high rates of aspiration, a, a group that's near and dear to my heart, and so I throw them in whenever possible. So how do we go about diagnosing aspiration? It's really, um, it's really a kind of a multidisciplinary and multimodal undertaking to diagnose it. Um, there's kind of the initial signs and symptoms that might lead you down that pathway. And then once you start down the pathway, there's a combination of clinical and instrumental evaluation, imaging and endoscopy to all help um, sort of sort out the diagnosis, but also to try and, and identify the etiology. So there's just basic signs and symptoms of aspiration, um, especially in younger children. Young, younger children, it's coughing or choking when feeding, um, wet sounding breathing. Um, so parents will sometimes sound, describe them at the kids as sounding as if they're drowning or as if they're really gurgly. Um, sometimes though, aspiration can be silent. So there actually are no signs and symptoms. And it's not until you start to see a pattern of things like recurrent pneumonia, uh, that you really get clued into the fact that there may be ongoing aspiration. And that video there is just an example of, of a fees study of a child who's aspirating terribly to kind of illustrate. As you watch that, you can in your head imagine how wet that child's cry um, in voice would sound. So why do we really care about aspiration? Um, in the, you know, the reason we care is not, not necessarily the aspiration itself, um, but the, the long-term um, problems that it can cause. So over time, aspiration can create chronic damage to the lungs, um, which is once, once you reach a certain point can be very difficult to recover from. Um, these kids oftentimes need frequent suctioning. They've got the noisy breathing and the choking, and that, that can be very scary for a family. Recurrent pneumonia, like we talked about. And in some instances, if you've got aspiration that's sig significant enough or has gone on, uh, for a long enough period of time, you can actually end up with a child who is oxygen or ventilator dependent 
uh, because of the damage. And what our pulmonary doctors always like to say is that the lung really works better when it's called upon to not be a digestive organ. So, so food, liquid, it just doesn't belong down in the lungs. They don't like it. So when we think about aspiration, one of the first things we want to try and sort out is what is the child aspirating? And there are really kind of three categories of that. Um, they can be aspirating um, food or liquid. They can be aspirating their own saliva or they can be aspirating uh, their own reflux. And sorting, again, sorting out which of those things they're aspirating is oftentimes key to the management. So once you start down this pathway, again, like I said, confirming the diagnosis based on clinical symptoms is usually multidisciplinary. Here in Cincinnati, our kids who are aspirating are typically seen and evaluated by speech language pathology and or occupational therapy who do some of our some of our feeding evaluations, uh, the pulmonary team, and then the ENT team. So the, the speech language pathologists, when they do an oral motor examination, they're looking um, at a variety of things related to both oral, oral anatomy, but also um, oral function and swallowing function. So they're looking just at the general anatomy, checking the palate, uh, making sure that there's no cleft, um, looking at some of the oral motor patterns, and this is particularly relevant in some kids who are either syndromic or who have um, cranial nerve deficits where they may not have symmetry of all of their facial movements or their tongue movements. Um, and then also just I mean, the, the steps involved in swallowing and, and what is the child doing with the different, the different steps depending on how old they are. Um, are they able to move the bolus appropriately from the front to the back and some of those sorts of things. Um, and then they also look at the developmentally appropriate skills and see how a child is doing with each of these things. Um, and this is oftentimes, this is oftentimes what will generate in some instances the referral to ENT or to pulmonary as kids will get to this point and see a speech language pathologist and have issues identified and then they'll come on to us. In those kids in which there's a clinical concern for aspiration, they almost always get some sort of instrumental evaluation um, as part of their evaluation. And this is obtained to answer specific questions about their swallowing. Um, the test that's chosen is really going to depend um, on the question being asked, and it's not uncommon um, that kids get multiple iterations of these tests because they're complementary and give, give slightly different bits of information. So the, there are two main tests that we use. The first is the video fluoroscopic swallow study, this is in many places also referred to as a modified barium swallow. And this um, is done collaboratively between a radiologist and a speech language pathologist and is really um, in, in the world of aspiration and speech, considered the gold standard for the evaluation of dysphagia and aspiration. Um, it will determine through this test if airway protection is de deficient and sort of at what level the deficiency appears to be happening. The other one that's used very commonly is, is the uh, fiber optic endoscopic evaluation of swallowing, also sometimes called functional endoscopic evaluation of swallowing, depending on what you read. Mostly we call it a fees because it's a lot quicker to say. So this is also a, a combined examination where you've got an otolaryngologist who's going to do the endoscopy and a speech language pathologist who is um, going to sort of provide the foods and um, determine which food textures to be tested. And then jointly, those two, those two providers will develop recommendations based on, on the assessment and what is seen. The, the additional benefit to the fees is that it allows you to directly assess the larynx so you can determine if the vocal folds are mobile, um, and you can also determine if laryngeal sensation is intact, um, which, is, which can be an important factor um, in kids who are aspirating, particularly those who are aspirating silently. The other advantage of the fees is that it can be done even in children who really take nothing by mouth who, or those who have significant oral aversions and you just can't get them to take anything. A video swallow study requires a child to be able to take a decent amount of volume for the study to be useful. Um, whereas the fees, even if a child's not swallowing, you can always put some dye in the saliva um, and watch what they do with their own saliva. So there are some, there, there are some benefits to the fees, although it is certainly a bit more invasive and kids don't always love it. So this is looking just at two, kind of side by side. This is obviously a slightly older person here. And when you watch the video swallow study, you'll see the bolus sort of transit through the back of the throat. And here I'll play again. And then you see the bolus sort of divide into two. Part goes down posteriorly down the esophagus and then a big amount of it goes down uh, uh, the trachea. 
which is clearly where we would prefer it to not go. Um, the next video right here is the fees. Um, and this is the view you get, right? You've got the camera through the nose and it's sitting there in the, in the hypopharynx. Um, and you can watch um, as the green, I'm gonna play it one more time. You'll watch the green food colored material uh, pass along the right and a little bit of it slips right over the retinoids at the back and down into the airway. Now, one of the big disadvantages of a fees is that you get that momentary whiteout during the swallow where you lose kind of your visualization. So that can make it a little bit more difficult to interpret at times. But they're, like I said, they're oftentimes uh, used complementary. So those are the instrumental evaluations. And then certainly radiology or imaging plays a role. Um, a chest X-ray is oftentimes where we start, especially with smaller children. Um, and you know, you're looking for signs of lung damage. A chest X-ray is considerably less useful looking for some of the chronic changes that are listed here, um, is much more useful when you're looking for acute pneumonias. Um, it can also still show you things about atelectasis and some of these other things, but it's just not nearly as sensitive um, as far as looking for the more chronic lung damage. And so in those kids where they're either a little bit older or you have significant concerns that they have had, they've been aspirating long enough that they may have lung damage, um, that's where a CT of the chest is really particularly useful. And you can see in a CT of the chest, things you're looking for are listed there, a thickened airway, um, which you can, it's a, a little hard to see when they're small pictures, but you can see that you know the airways themselves are thickened. Um, you're looking for air trapping, Mucus plugs are collapsed areas, which you can see a, a lot of consolidation there um, in that middle picture. Um, you can look for things, bronchiectasis or the chronic scarring, um, and it's just considerably more sensitive for monitoring for those changes. And then endoscopy is also an, a, an important component in kids who, once you have shown on an instrumental evaluation that they are in fact aspirating, um, endoscopy is important. Um, for a variety of reasons. So we will typically do these combined with pulmonary. They'll get a flexible bronchoscopy. This is an older video. Our bronchoscopists typically actually use a camera and watch this on a screen, but this was the video that was immediately available. So that's how it's done in there. And you can see on the, the lower view is actually the exact correlating view to what you're seeing in the top screen um, as, as the bronchoscopist is passing the scope um, through, through the nasal passage and then down into the airway. So flexible bronchoscopy is very useful because it lets you get down into the lungs and actually take a sample for culture and to look for lipid-laden macrophages and to look for inflammation and just really see the cellular makeup of whatever, whatever may be down in the lungs. Um, they also, because the scope is flexible and small and bendy, it can get much further out into the tracheobronchial tree. It can go around corners. It can look up into that right main stem, which is sometimes more difficult to do with rigid, rigid instrumentation. Of course, it does require a general anesthetic. Um, and one of the big disadvantages is that it's difficult to visualize the posterior glottis, which is relevant as we consider some of the anatomic deficits that can contribute to aspiration. So again, with bronchoscopy, you're looking you know, at, at the lung, at the mucus, at the secretions that are present. In some instances, well, actually, this is a, a good example of a child who has a lot of, a lot of secretions um, distally. Um, and it, Flexible bronchoscopy can be useful for clearing some of those secretions out. And it is also useful sort of in the longer term because you can use it to, to um, follow a response to therapy. So rigid bronchoscopy is, is typically what the ENTs do, at least here, that's how we divide it up. I know some places ENT does both or, or pediatric surgery will do both depending on where you're at. Um, so rigid bronchoscopy has got the advantage of, of being really able to look for some of the anatomic an anomalies, um, particularly in aspiration um, that you may not be able to see as easily um, on uh, a flexible bronchoscopy. And again, these two videos, they correlate. So that's the actual video th that's being seen with the scope um, on the, on the um, on the left there, and that's Dr. Rudder. For those of you who have not met him, he's one of my senior my senior colleagues uh, who trained me. Uh, he's got considerably more gray hair. That video is a, a few years old at this point. Uh, disadvantages um, of the rigid bronchoscopy is, of course, the telescope is rigid; it doesn't bend, and that can limit its usefulness. 
um, and it re can require a fair amount of skill uh, to be able to do it effectively. So of the things that we're really looking for in a child who's aspirating, um, the big anatomic features to be especially uh, in, on the lookout for are the H-type um, tracheoesophageal fistulas. Um, these can be, can be incredibly difficult to see. They're very easy sometimes to just fly past them and not notice them. Um, and I may actually restart this video just so that we can see it from the beginning. And if you watch as the telescope passes down, there we just flew right past the TEF. It's that little tiny divot there. And until you get really close to it, do you actually fully appreciate it's there? And then we passed a flexible suction catheter into it. Once you do that, you can see that it's actually quite large. Um, and these kids can be tricky because they can actually have um, swallow studies that are completely normal. Um, and so it's, it's not uncommon that these get missed and they sometimes don't get diagnosed until, uh, until later than you would expect. Um, and even though they oftentimes seem like they're pretty small, and you can see in that still photo now just how big that, that opening actually is, and they, they oftentimes will require an open repair to, um, to fix them. The other really important thing to look for in any child who's aspirating is the laryngeal cleft. And these can be really tricky to see as well. So you're seeing um, what's playing right now is a, a flexible bronchoscopy in a child where the pulmonologist in the ENT, they knew this kid was aspirating. They had a really high suspicion for a cleft. And this is one of our best flexible bronchoscopists who's trying really hard to demonstrate that there is a cleft present. And you could see in that video that it just doesn't look, it looks pretty normal. This is the same child with a rigid bronchoscopy and with an alligator being placed. And there you, you the cleft itself, a type one cleft is incredibly difficult to miss. So those are the exact same child, just different instruments, um, a really good example of why, why the two exams are very complementary. because if you had only done a flexible bronchoscopy on this child, you would have said, oh, looks, looks like a pretty normal posterior glottis, no cleft, and you would have moved on and might not have fixed the problem that the child had. So just a quick overview of, of cleft classification. Um, the, ones that, the ones that are the, the trickiest for kids um, to diagnose are really you know, the type ones um, in the deep, the deep notches, which aren't in this uh, video or in this picture. Um, and those are the ones um, that, that oftentimes it's the kids who otherwise pretty normal healthy kids, but they're aspirating and you find a, a, just a little type one cleft um, and that can be a big game changer for them. Obviously the, the um, more involved uh, clefts, the threes and fours um, are a little bit less uh, subtle from a diagnostic standpoint. So how do we manage these things? Well, if you find an anatomic problem, you fix the problem and it's actually, you know, that's great because hopefully, hopefully then you've, you've uh, solved the issue. And in kids who are otherwise pretty healthy and don't have, you know, neurologic issues, oftentimes that does the trick. Um, so if, again, the two big ones that we think about um, are the tracheoesophageal fistulas and the laryngeal clefts, both can be repaired endoscopically or open depending on the size and the location. Um, you can also have a whole host of other problems that are less common. And in the span of an hour, it was hard to get into all of them. But if you have issues with the esophagus and esophageal stricture, esophageal dysmotility, those can also lead to aspiration problems and sometimes require a surgical uh, fix but outside of what we're going to talk about today. So I can't, I can't give a talk on anything re related to the airway without it, including at least some airway uh, surgery videos. And so this is how we like to do laryngeal cleft repairs uh, here for, for deep notches, type one clefts, some type two clefts, and really a simple mass closure. It's not um, the most elegant of procedures. It's pretty straightforward, um, but you can see there at the beginning, the key is really denuding that interretinoid space and making sure that you get all the way down to the apex and don't leave any mucosa. Um, so that you don't create a little tiny gap at the bottom when it heals. Um, and then you simply um, throw, throw some stitches, um, minimum of two. Um, and, and for most uh, type one clefts, two is sufficient. If you get into a type two, you're gonna have to throw a few more. Um, and you wanna make sure you bring your repair up pretty high. Um, we typically use PDS suture. And then most commonly, we will also release the area epiglottic folds. As you bring that posterior glottis together, it kind of tightens things up a little bit. You release those A folds and it, it maintains a little extra space. 
this video uh, runs for a while, so I'm just going to jump ahead. So you can see one stitch is already in place there, and that's with the second stitch then um, uh, being tied down. Um, but you can see how it brings that repair up uh, pretty high uh, uh, along the posterior glottis. And then this is this is the same child then um, after the repair. This is probably about six weeks after surgery. They also have a little mild subglottic stenosis there. Um, but what isn't really the focus, but you can see how how that that bridge of tissue and now um, is well up above the level of the vocal cords. So in um, kids who don't have an anatomic issue, management becomes, again, a little bit more multidisciplinary and a little bit, um, in some ways, more complicated. So when there's no anatomic issue, you can look at alterations of diet and feeding. There's medications that can be used. Um, there's surgical management if you have ongoing issues with, with sialuria and aspiration of saliva. And then um, there is always, should always be a focus on pulmonary clearance um, to help maintain the health of the lung. So when we think about feeding options, again, this is gonna depend on the severity of the aspiration. And the, the, those instrumental evaluations, the video swallow study, uh, the, the fees study, um, part of those evaluations is determining what level of thickening makes it safe for a child to swallow. In some instances, it's just a mild amount of thickening and they can swallow safely without aspiration. And so you just think it, thicken their feeds uh, slightly. In some children, it doesn't matter how thick you make it, they can't safely swallow, or you have to make it so thick that they won't be able to, to feed from a bottle. Um, and in those kids, then you oftentimes, that's when you have to consider um, using either a nasogastric tube or actually placing a gastrostomy tube uh, to, to provide nutrition. Oftentimes, um, in kids um, who are, you've modified diet, or you've made them you know, strictly nothing by mouth and they're still aspirating, those are the kids who are oftentimes aspirating um, their saliva. And that's where you start thinking about medications then to manage, um, to manage saliva production. Um, most of these are fairly effective when they're first started, but they lose their uh, uh, effectiveness over time in many instances. Um, so the three main medications that we consider uh, for this role is glycopyrrolate, um, scopolamine, uh, which is the transdermal uh, hyacinth patches um, or a botulinum in injection. So glycopyrrolate is, is, is nice because it's a medication that families can titrate on their own. Um, some patients will take it twice a day, sometimes three times a day. They can go up to four times a day. And when it's first started, it's very effective um, in most patients. Uh, the tricky thing is that over time it becomes less effective and often, often patients have to increase their dose to maintain, um, to maintain the benefit. And as they increase the dose, the side effects also increase. And it's those side effects that will typically lead to discontinuation of the medications. Um, and so it can, really, it can really dry things out too much. You get dry mouth, thick secretions, but because of the way it works, it can also create some other systemic side effects such as urinary retention and flushing um, and those can oftentimes be the reason that these medications get discontinued. Um, the scopolamine patch, um, it's nice because you put it on and you leave it for a period of time. So it's not something you have to necessarily redose with quite the same frequency. Um, there is a little bit delay in, uh, in the response to it. So it doesn't work instantly. It very commonly has a bit of a sedative effect and can make kids sleepy or drowsy. And it can also um, impact the, the eye's ability to focus and accommodate. So it can make reading difficult. It can also impair vision. So in some kids who already have, you know, they may be mobile, but have some balance issues, um, these can create some different challenges for them um, if you make it harder for their eyes to accommodate. And then Botox is something we actually will use quite frequently in our kids who are having issues aspirating saliva. Um, so you, you all know how Botox works. Um, you know, when we, when we, for whatever purpose we're using it, but it, in the salivary glands, it de decreases production by blocking the release of neurotransmitters. It typically only lasts a couple of months. So somewhere between two and three months, and then you would have to, have to re-inject it. So here uh, we, um, our interventional radiology colleagues are actually the ones who do the Botox injections and they do it um, under ultrasound guidance directly into the salivary glands. And you can inject 
the, the parotid glands and the submandibular glands, um, depending on uh, the, the extent to which um, you're trying to um, get benefit. And as I mentioned, one of the other big components of this, and this slide is stolen from one of my uh, pulmonary colleagues, is trying to protect the lungs. So whatever the source of the aspiration is, whatever the etiology of the aspiration is, you wanna try and keep those lungs healthy. And there are a variety of techniques um, that our pulmonary team will do to use to do that. So it's very common that these kids are on albuterol or something equivalent because it helps open up the airways. Um, and then they will use uh, saline or hypertonic saline uh, that is nebulized, which helps hydrate the mucus. So it thins the mucus out, but it also stimulates the cough. So it helps, helps clear that mucus. We typically will use those things in combination with some sort of chest physiotherapy. Um, the picture here is a, a child who's using a vest. Um, so these are used commonly in kids who have something like cystic fibrosis, but in some of our kids with chronic lung disease due to aspiration, um, we will also use the, the same sort of therapy. There's also a role for azithromycin um, in some of these kids because it, when we use it not as an antibiotic, but as an anti-inflammatory, and so we will typically then just give this three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Um, it has been shown to decrease the inflammation in the lungs, and for a lot of these kids, it actually decreases the number of hospital admissions. And then if there's an infection present, then you use more traditional antibiotic therapies. One of the things we always like to caution against, um, it, apart from kids who have really severe reflux who need it managed, you do have to use caution with reflux medications because it does alter the flora of the, of the gastric contents and can make uh, children more prone to aspiration pneumonia um, when you, when you uh, have them on high dose reflux medications. So it's just something to keep in mind. So in our kids who um, are having you know, failure of medical treatments as far as managing the sialuria, um, or if you've got families who just don't wanna continue with medical therapy, they did Botox, had a really great response, uh, but now there's, they just don't wanna continue repeating the Botox, or those where the drilling is just so profuse um, in kids who have aspiration with significant pulmonary complications, then we sometimes move on to consideration of surgical treatment um, of, uh, to decrease salivary production. And the way I think of this in, in um, a lot of kids is you're really trying to um, decrease the amount of flow. So for a lot of kids, especially those who have an impaired swallow for whatever reason, if they have their, their normal salivary production, it's like they're trying to drink from a fire hose. And there's just so much saliva that they can't effectively even begin to, to manage it. If you can turn that flow down so that it's more like a garden hose, it's a much more manageable thing to figure out how to drink from. And so you're trying to decrease the salivary production so that it can be more manageable for the child. And, and oftentimes by doing that, it gets kids who, even those who have, are hypotonic or have have a poor functional swallow to a point that they can swallow um, the smaller amount of secretions more effectively. So the, our, our go-to surgical procedure um, in these kids is what we call a drool procedure. Um, so that's where we, where we excise bilateral submandibular glands and then we ligate uh, both parotid ducts. And we have a, a couple of partners who in the past would typically only ligate one parotid duct to start in order to avoid overdrying. Um, but when you do this combination, it's successful in about 85% of cases, which is pretty reasonable. Um, and this is, I mean, a submandibular gland excision is, is fairly straightforward. Um, although it can be done intraorally, I think all of us here do, do an, an external approach and you just simply remove both glands. Um, the parotid duct ligation, the video is being shown there. Um, you, you make a little like, incision around the papilla, isolate the duct. Uh, tie it off uh, with a permanent suture. This is a, a silk suture being used. Um, and then um, truncate that little nub and enclose it with just one or two uh, chromic sutures. Um, and again, pr pretty effective, pretty well tolerated. Certainly complications are possible. Um, so <laughs> this is a slide, I give this talk, a, a similar talk to families. And that's why it says, the nerve that controls the lower lip instead of the marginal mandibular nerve. I meant to change that and just forgot to. Um, but, but certainly when you excise the submandibular glands, that's probably the biggest complication. In about 10% of kids, you get overdry mouth um, that can be problematic and then they have to do some things to try and supplement their saliva production. 
Um, in the literature, that's at about 10%. I, I think anecdotally, I think most of us see that less frequently uh, than 10%. Probably the most common thing we see is that those parotid ducts can recanalize, um, and so you can continue to get activity of the parotid gland, um, or you can get a mucosal that forms along the duct. Um, so if you're worried um, that uh, the parotid duct has recanalized, um, we, we will typically diagnose that using a, um, what we call a spit scan or a radionucleotide parotid scan, which just looks for activity uh, within the duct, or within the gland rather, and if, that's, if there is still ongoing activity, you can re-ligate it. Um, oftentimes, we will do Botox at the same time as the ligation um, to try and minimize the production um, while, while the, the duct is scarring off and you're getting them that, that atrophy of the gland. And then there's also potentially, in these, if they've recanalized, um, a role for a tympanic neurectomy, which again just takes away uh, further stimulation of salivary production. So, even when you do this, um, it, the surgery may be successful. The parotid ducts may be not recanalized, and your parotid ducts may have atrophied. In some of these kids, they may continue to aspirate. Um, and that's true, particularly if they have just minimal swallowing function, so they just don't swallow spontaneously, um, or if they have esophageal motility issues. Um, those kids oftentimes then continue to aspirate, uh, in many instances, reflex. And that can be a bit of a tougher problem to manage. So certainly as you march down the progression, um, a tracheotomy is an option. Um, of course, keeping in mind that the tracheotomy itself is not preventing aspiration, but making it easier to suction the lungs and to provide that pulmonary clearance to keep keep at bay the ongoing pulmonary damage or that chronic lung damage. Um, so this is a pretty common misconception that we see not only amongst some of our families, but even amongst um, physicians here who don't necessarily uh, treat or work in the airway a lot. They'll think that the tracheostomy itself is preventing the aspiration, um, which, which again, it's not. But um, we are more likely to sort of end up going down this path if the child has um, significant upper airway obstruction, has other airway abnormalities, or has chronic lung disease, um, and is heading down the path towards perhaps needing a ventilator um, as a result of that chronic disease. As we move to kind of all the way down the spectrum on our surgical options, a laryngotracheal separation, of course, um, is the only treatment that's going to be 100% effective in pre preventing aspiration. Um, once you have done an LT separation, those patients are unable to talk uh, using, at least using normal laryngeal speech, depending on their, um, their neurologic capacity, they may be able to use esophageal speech or use uh, alternative devices, um, but they're unable to phonate. And that's a really important thing, um, in, especially if there are patients who do do some phonation um, or have some vocalization, um, you have to make sure families understand that you'll be taking that away. Um, and so we will typically only head down this pathway if lungs are extremely damaged uh, due to aspiration. Uh, so just in summary, um, you know, pediatric aspiration, um, it's a growing problem. Um, we, see, we see it more commonly as increasing numbers of, of children who are predisposed to aspiration survive. Um, aspiration can be of food and drink, it can be of saliva, it can be of reflux. Um, and sorting out which of those things it is is important because it's going to influence how you manage it. The diagnosis is multidisciplinary and typically done through multiple modalities, as is the management, right? So in the management, we will oftentimes think of in kind of a stepwise fashion. Obviously, if there's anything um, anatomic that can be easily repaired, you repair that and sort of take it off the table um, and then use that combination of diet alter alteration, medical management, pulmonary optimization, and then um, surgical management for ongoing salary if it's present. The first question is from Ishan. He's asking, in your practice, is there a role of interretinoid injection in deep bruise or type 1 laryngeal clefts above the level of the vocal cords? So that's a great question. So um, generally speaking, um, uh, myself and my partners don't do a whole lot of injections. They can, they can be useful sometimes as kind of a proof of concept, if you will. Um, so you have a child who has a deep notch. Um, so maybe this, you know, so certainly maybe not all the way down uh, to the cords, like you said, the level of just above the level of the cords. Um, 
you can do an injection, see if they get better. Um, and if they do, um, you know, if once the injection wears off, then you can formally repair. The tricky thing I think um, with that concept is that you can do uh, you can do the injection, um, and if the child doesn't get better, you don't know if it was because the injection wasn't adequate or or if there's some other issue. And so, um, oftentimes, because the repair itself um, is fairly straightforward, the recovery is minimal, complications are minimal. I prefer to just repair it, um, and that way you don't have to have a return trip. Um, to repair it if it is successful. Um, but there are certainly a number of places that do that injection um, and, and get good results with it. You just either oftentimes have to repeat it or then formally repair at some point. Thank you. Um, another question is from Athens from Olga. She's asking, is LT separation reversible in cases uh, in case child's condition improves? So theoretically, it is touted as being a reversible operation. I have seen one patient in whom reversal was attempted and it's incredibly difficult to do. Um, you know, I think, so I would make the argument that if you really think a child might be on the path to potential improvement, then an LT separation is probably not the way to go. Um, trach that child and manage them that way um, because it, it's much easier to, to get a trach out um, than it is to reverse a separation. So. It theoretically can be done, um, but it can be really difficult to get, you know, when you do the LT separation, you, you, you divide, you know, at the, just below the cricoid, pull the trachea out to the neck, and then you over sew that subglottis. And most of us, when we do that, to ensure that it really, really heals, we actually will fracture the cricoid um, and bring that cricoid in to kind of help with the closure. And so once you've done that, you've created a pretty wicked subglottic stenosis it can be tough to manage if you're trying to make it not stenotic anymore. Thank you very much. Um, another question is, um, for, uh, for Botox injection, do you inject all four glands at the same time? So we most commonly, yes, will um, we'll inject all four glands, um, unless we're doing it in the context of where we've, we've actually removed the submandibular glands at the time. Um, then obviously you're not going to inject glands that aren't there. But most commonly we will go ahead and, ahead and inject all four. Um, it seems to give the best result. Um, sometimes we'll have families who want to kind of go stepwise, in which case we'll do just the parotids uh, to see if we can get them uh, in a good enough spot. And if so, then we stop there. And if not, then we would, we would inject all four subsequently. Perfect. Um, and another question for laryngeal cleft uh, repair, is endoscopic or open approach superior? So it depends um, on the, the type of cleft. Um, let's see, if you go back to the images of the cleft, I would tell you for a, a type one, um, you should, endoscopic should be your go-to. For many type twos, um, so for many type twos, endoscopic is perfect. Um, you can get to where you need to, um, and it, the recovery is much easier. Um, type threes um, can again also oftentimes be repaired endoscopically. It can be a little bit a little bit more difficult to get to that most distal aspect, and that's really the key of a cleft repair is making sure the distal most part of the cleft is uh, is is. Um, demucosalized uh, or separated, depending on how you're doing it, and that that part heals adequately. Um, and so once you get, if it's a long type three, or when you get into those type fours, then then certainly an open repair would be the more the, the more traditional approach and is going to have better outcomes. Um, interestingly, so when I, you know, I was trained by Dr. Cotton here before he retired, um, and he um, didn't offer, uh, um, in many cases, for any of you who spent time here, he didn't always scrub in. He was always around, but he didn't scrub in. Every time we ever did an open cleft repair, he would scrub and he would throw the, the distomose stitch because it was the, the one that was most likely to fail and the one that was most important. Um, so so for, to kind of summarize that, for types 1 and 2, endoscopic um, is a more straightforward repair. The healing is faster. You get a great outcome. Um, as you get into type 3s and 4s, it's the threes, it depends on your endoscopic skills. Um, and certainly the longer threes and the fours, you're going to get a better outcome with an open approach. Thank you. Thank you very much for that answer. Um, I have uh, another couple of questions. So I um, uh, just wanted to confirm, 
uh, that you mentioned that VFS is a gold standard test for assessment of swallow slash aspiration. Is that for all pediatric age groups? Um, and the second question to go along with that is, have you faced opposition or concerns from radiologists uh, from the radiation do dose point of view? Yeah, so it's a great question. So um, it is considered the gold standard across age groups. Um, as I mentioned, it does require that a child be able to take a certain volume by mouth. So usually at bare minimum, it needs to be about 20 mLs. Um, if they're not taking that much, then, then the study itself is just, it is not adequate to really see what's going on. Um, there is some discussion about the, the radiation dose. To do a good video swallow study or modified barium swallow study, the radiation dose is relatively high. I don't remember the number right off the top of my head, but it's not insignificant. Um, and so certainly that's, again, part of the reason that with the, the two studies can be really helpful if you have the capability to do both, because the video swallow study, again, gold standard for looking for aspiration, and it's oftentimes a little, it's oftentimes easier to really see that material is getting down into the trachea, um, right? Because you can't see the trachea when you're doing a fees. Um, you're, you're just seeing things enter the, enter the glottis and pass below the cords. Um, but if you're feeling the need to repeat it frequently, that cumulative dose of, of radi radiation, um, our, our radiologists will certainly push back. And we, so we do try to be mindful um, we will sometimes have kids come and they've gotten a video swallow study, you know, every two or three months for the first year and a half of life. And that's an awful, awful lot of radiation. Um, but there, there is enough value to the study that, that when done in the right amount of moderation, um, our radiologists um, are, quite, are quite accepting of it. Brilliant. So that's all the questions from everyone. Um, thank you so much again for your time um, and your expertise and coming to talk to us tonight. We really, really appreciate it. And hopefully we'll welcome you back once more uh, at some point in the future.